socialstudiesgames.us, Unit 7, Video 3, as always, based on the AP US History Guidelines. I can define the 19th Amendment. I can describe the life of women in the early 1900s. In the early 1900s, women enter the workforce more so than ever before, and they fill mainly feminine jobs. Probably not a way that you would want to describe work today. We're talking about secretar secretarial work, telephone operator gigs. We'll talk about that in a second. But you don't want to say that today. You don't want to say, well, that's a feminine job. That's a masculine job. Probably problematic. You can find a better way to describe those jobs. But we're using the AP US History Guidelines. We're basing this on history where, guess what? Ding, ding, ding. 100 years ago, our country was very sexist, misogynist, unequal. It's still that way today. Not like it was then. So telephone operator, you may have heard of this thing called a telephone where you pick it up and you call someone. Well, the way that it worked 100 years ago, you would call into a telephone operator and that telephone operator would plug in all the things and then uh, redirect you to the actual person that you're speaking to. Wow, crazy old technology. Well, the big idea here is not specifically the jobs they did or the feminine type of jobs that they did, but it's the fact that they have jobs and that women are entering the workforce in mass numbers. That's huge because if you rewind the clock 100 years before that, women mainly were at home. It was called the cult of domesticity. The, the normal belief or the culture said women stay at home. They are natural nurturers. They take care of the children. Meanwhile, the man goes out and works and the man goes out and he takes care of the family and he goes out and he's political and he makes the decisions. And that's the way the country was. And the job for the woman was to stay at home. And that was her world. Whereas the whole world was the man's world. Not really fair. So this is breaking out of that, that cult of domesticity, breaking out of the home, going out in the public. Now, when you're out in public and you're out in society and you're working, and you're engaging, it's spreads and you become more politically active and through political active activism you fight for rights you fight for laws that you believe in and this is going to learn lead to growth and development and equality and this is how it works so when we have an oppressed group or a minority group or any specific group for that matter the government, America, or any society or any nation in particular doesn't just simply say, oh, look at those guys. They don't have it equal. We should just make it equal. Or, hey, look at you, man. Your life is so tough. We should just help you out. That is not the way that it works. The way that it works is you have to grind. You got to get out there and you got to work it. And through being politically active, through being active in the economy, through being active in your community, slowly but surely over time, you influence more people and more people influence other people. And eventually you're able to push laws together that create a more equal society. And this is an example of women working their way up. Now, speaking of equality, they didn't get paid as much. And some people argue today that women still unequally get paid. And I will listen to that argument if you can give me the specific stats and research. Because a lot of that information that you get tossed around, like women make 76 cents on the dollar or only get paid three quarters of what men get paid. Well, a lot of those numbers have been skewed and manipulated for political purposes. Some people use that data. Guess what, guys? Sometimes people will tell you something to get you to vote for them. Imagine that. If you look at the research and you really dive into the numbers, you might find out that, yeah, in some cases, women are, uh, are treated unequally. But you might also find out that, wow, pay is actually a lot more equal than I've been led to believe. But again, you got to do the research on your own. You got to dive into the numbers. And maybe you'll find out that, no, no, Mr. Dietrich, it's not equal. And I can show you specifically how and where it's not equal. Good. Do your research. Don't just listen to me. Don't just listen to the people on TV. Look, I'm not trying to get your vote. You don't have, I'm not trying to persuade you. And I always give you both sides of the argument, but a lot of people that will feed you facts and feed you information, they're doing it for their own personal gain. So be careful who you listen to. You always listen to me, but think about it. What motivation do I have? Am I trying to convince you to do anything or, or teach you something? Or there's no way that I can benefit from, from brainwashing you. Some people though can, because they're trying to get your vote. Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. So this is going to continue with the theme of women, but we're going to bring in another theme as well. The Triangle Shirtwaist Factory is a horrific tragedy in America. It's actually the, uh, I think, the biggest loss of life in New York up until 9-11. I got to double check and look at those numbers. So the one of the biggest, obviously we know what 9-11 is, a September 11th tax, but we talk about the another major loss of life. I think you got to go all the way back to the triangle shirtwaist factor. So what happens in this? So first of all, you got to understand the idea that America is going from agrarian or basically an agricultural society, and we are slowly but surely 
evolving and developing into an industrialized society. We're having an industrial revolution. We are going from farming and simple jobs to factories and machines. And you don't just go like from from basic tasks to factory work overnight. There are a lot of bumps in the road in that growth and in that development, and we make a lot of mistakes. And unfortunately, there's a lot of tragedy that happens where they're like, oh, that's not the right way to do that, or oh, mm, that was a mistake. So the mistake that they have here is the women are working in the garment factory, the eighth floor of this building, going about their job. Now, one of the common things that happened was that the the owner or the boss, the manager, typically a man, didn't want the women taking excessive breaks and so what they would do is uh, they would actually chain the door shut, lock the door shut so the women couldn't get off the floor. Well, it just happens on the day that they did that, which was every day. A fire breaks out and the women get trapped. There is an elevator, but how many elevator trips are going to happen in time, right? Maybe one, maybe two at most. And how many people can you put on an elevator? Sad story is 146 women die in this fire. 50 of which don't want to stay on the floor and die in the fire. They don't want to die of asphyxiation. So they plummet to their death. They jump out. 50 women just jump out of the building. That makes it a little bit more of a problem because the firemen can't get close to the building because there's too many falling bodies. Also, another problem, the ladder that the firefighters have only reaches, I think, the fifth floor and they're on the eighth floor. Again, another problem. It's like, hmm, we should have thought of that before. Yeah, we should have thought of a lot of things before. We should have been bigger ladders. We shouldn't have locked the uh, doors shut. Maybe we should have had more doors. Maybe we should have fire extinguishers. We, you know, instead of just a bucket of water. We should have had a lot of things in place. And that's the big thing. They didn't have a lot of those ideas that you think are common sense today or that you take for granted. Because remember, we're going from these basic jobs. We're going from apprenticeships. We're going from simple machine jobs and agrarian society to bam, out of nowhere and industrialized society. And that's why you get 100 workers dying every single day. And guess what? A lot of the factories, we're just trying to make money. We're just trying to make as much stuff as we possibly can. We're not really worried about safety. And you've probably done that yourself. You've done something like you're building something in your backyard. Or you're helping your dad out and you're just trying to get the job done. The next thing you know, you got a nail in your head Ah! because you're Russian and you're not so concerned about safety. You're just trying to get the job done. And that's what factories and that's what was happening during the Industrial Revolution. Well, that's not really a good thing. You need to think about safety. And this horrific event is an example of we got to start thinking about safety. And if you're not going to think about safety, then the government's going to do it for you. I am a free market guy. I believe in laissez-faire capitalism where the government should be hands-off, not getting involved. But I don't mean that they should be completely hands-off. There are situations and circumstances that call for the government to get involved because business will not do what they need to do unless they are told to do it. And I make jokes about these yellow signs, but you need them in place. If you don't have those safety regulations in place, people can get hurt. And it doesn't take much to put safety uh, plans on the wall in every room, in every building, in every school and put exit signs so that the power goes out, you know how to get to the exit and put fire extinguishers and all those things and smoke alarms and put that in place. The government makes laws that force businesses to do it. Yet it costs businesses more and it hurts their profits, but it is necessary. Government involvement. Suffrage, just a fancy word for the right to vote. Now, during this time, women did not have the right to vote. Now, technically, they did, but they didn't. So if you look at the original Constitution, there is nothing in the original Constitution that says women can vote. There's nothing that says women cannot vote. So we refer to the Tenth Amendment of the Constitution, which says anything that is not written in the Constitution, those powers are reserved for the states. It's up to the states. Nothing about women voting in the Constitution, so it's up to to the states. In some states, mainly states out west, who are trying to attract people to move to their states, because remember, if you get enough people in your state, then you become a, an official state. So one of the ways that they do it is they attract women by saying, come to our state, we are going to allow you to vote. So some states out west allow women to vote, but federally, when we talk about all 50 states, you did not, women did not have the right to vote. So they pick it group of people standing outside a place, work or other venue, protesting something. Sounds a lot like the picketing or the protesting or the striking we talked about with the labor workers against their bosses for fair wages, for fair hours, for equal rights. Women picket for the right to vote. They don't, they can't vote. Like, why don't they just vote to give them the self? Well, you can't vote to give yourself the right to vote if you can't vote. So what they have to do is picket and persuade the men who are the only ones that have the right to vote at this time. They got to persuade men by picketing to say, hey, you guys, you have the power right now and you have to do us a favor. You're going to have to vote 
to make it an amendment that we can vote. So they organize across the country. Now, you can't just say, hey, uh, I'm going to go over here and pick it today. You really need an organization to tie everyone together and make sure everyone shows up to make the signs, to make the protest or the pickets effective. And you get the League of Women Voters designed to bring the women together to create the pickets nationwide in 50 states, hundreds of cities to promote this idea of we need the right to vote. We should be treated equal. There's this thing called the Declaration of Independence that says all men are created equal. Well, I know it says men, but we know what Thomas Jefferson meant. It means that all human beings are equal and you voting and me not being allowed to vote, that's not equal. You need to change that. So the League of Women Voters was formed to push this idea and push this amendment. It's still around today. You'll see like, well, this looks like it's a lot more modern. That's true because the League of Women Voters, they don't fight for the right to vote anymore, but they fight for voting rights. They fight for issues that support women. They uh, find issues that women support and they push those forward and they encourage women to uh, do these things. So the 19th Amendment is added to the U.S. Constitution, which gives women the right to vote in every state. So it's not only the specific states. And now women have, it's, it would be crazy to imagine, oh, women have equal rights. No, but now they have a process or they have the means now to, uh, to vote and try to create a more equal society. So the 19th Amendment, pretty simple. It gives women the right to vote. The life of women, you can think about the shirtwaist factory fire. Or you can talk about the jobs that women did during this time and maybe compare the work of women then to now. Are there some similarities? Are there differences? You can think about pay. Is there similarities to unequal pay? Are there differences to unequal pay? And why was this moment significant? All right, that's all we got for you today.